Okay, so um, what I wanted to present to you today was actually this paper, Focus Preserving Embeddings of Substructural Logic in Intuitionistic Logic. Um, but um, even though I'm a co-author on it, I realized after looking at it all day yesterday and last night that I don't really understand it well enough to explain it. Microscopically, it all makes sense. You look at each step and you look at each part of the proof and it makes sense, but I don't really understand why it works. So therefore, I can't explain it. So then this morning, I changed tack and I said, let's try to do something different, okay? Let's try to reconstruct what's there and then at a certain point, it goes off into a different direction. And that different direction is probably wrong, okay? And so you can help me out a lot by showing me where it's going wrong. And if not, okay, we'll have found something new, okay? So what's the story? Okay, so last time we had this new inference system. And remember that we had this relation that if in linear logic we had just sequent gamma delta proves A, then we map this, so this is in linear logic, we map this into um, another form of sequence where gamma was situated at epsilon, um, delta was situated at some alphas, and on the right-hand side, um, we had A at alpha one star, star alpha n, okay? And these alphas are these uh, resource expressions which can be either epsilon or they can be p1 star p2 or they can be alphas which are variables and they satisfy associativity p, p, p star q star r equals p star q star r is commutativity and epsilon is the unit of star, okay? And we're able to give inference rules here in such a way that we got a bijection between the linear logic rules and these rules with explicit resources. And that was a very nice, in some ways it was a very nice story. Now when you're talking about the semantics, what you usually think of is not giving an alternative um, set of inference rules, but you think of interpreting the formulas from one logic into a different domain, like a mathematical domain or into another logic. So you give a semantics by explaining what the meaning of formulas are in a different formalism, okay? So if you wanted to take this through, what we would, if you wanted to give traditional style of semantics here, we would have to find the translation from linear logic formulas, okay, into formulas where this kind of thing can be expressed, okay? Um, in such a way that something is provable here if and only if it's provable in the image of the translation. So we didn't quite do that because we give inference rules directly for our linear logic connectives using these judgments, which is a slightly different take. Okay. So what I want to do today is to take that program a little bit further and try to see if you can translate formulas here okay, into some logic in which you can express these things. Um, and we do this translation in a compositional way. So the meaning of a compound formula is composed of the meaning of its components, right? That's the, the name of the game that we're trying to play. Um, okay, and for a certain fragment, I'm pretty confident that it's gonna work. In fact, I've proven that it works, okay? Or Jason has proven and I've checked his proof, okay? Um, but like I said, I, there's something I don't understand about that translation. So actually, one of the new assignments is Figure out and explain this to me, okay? Assignment seven, okay? Figure out why this paper works and explain it to me, okay? And you get an A for the class if you succeed in doing that, okay? And so that I can understand it, okay? Anyway, what we're doing now is the following. So we want to give the meaning of the formula. So I don't know if you've seen traditional Kripke style semantics. Anybody seen Kripke style semantics here? Okay, so the idea is something like, you know, box A is true at some world um, at some world W, maybe something like this. Okay, so this is in classical logic, so I hesitate to even write it, but okay. okay. Bear with me, okay. So box A is true in W if uh, for all W prime, which are reachable from W, A 
is true of w prime. OK, so something like this. Right? So you give a kind of a, a meaning of the, the connectors by saying how it decomposes of the meaning of the pieces using these worlds. And we want to do something similar, but we want to use it for these resource label expressions that are worlds. Because resource label, in some sense, are very similar to expressing worlds, okay? um, but in a slightly different way. Okay. So, and we're going to be guided by what we have done so far. Okay, so let's just start at a very simple, very simple case. Um, so we have A linearly implies B, and we want to interpret this at some resource label P. Okay. So we can ask ourselves what might this possibly translate into? Okay. Okay. And over what we want to put over here is some kind of an expression in intuitionistic logic. Okay. So let me just, for reference, what do we have in intuitionistic logic? Okay. Um, so we have things like um, A implies B, uh, A and B, true for all x type tau A, which may depend on x. And if you have to do other things, oh, we have existential quantification. We have disjunction. Uh, we have falsehood. Okay. So they're very similar to our connectors with slightly, you know, less uh, distinction. So A implies B already looked at in detail in linear logic. You know what that is? It's mean you can use A in unrestricted way to prove B. This A and B actually be is a, uh, a merge, so to speak, of the two forms of conjunction. Okay, in linear logic, because if you have if your logic is not linear, you cannot really distinguish the multiplicative conjunction from the additive conjunction. In intuitionistic logic, we have only one form of conjunction and only one form of truth. The, the quantifications are the same. The disjunction and falsehood are also the same as we're used to in linear logic. Okay, so, okay. so that's the, the image of our translation for now. Um, we'll have to make some changes as we go along. But um, Okay, so let's see. The idea for this, A implies B, is that in order to prove that, if you remember the right rule for it, we introduced a new label. So let's write down the right rule, actually. So we had some gamma, and we're trying to prove A, B, at P, uh, P. So what we did is we introduced a new alpha. Okay, and then we had B at P. So alpha, and we had to remember that alpha was chosen new. Okay, that was the right rule. Okay, so we're going to use that as, as um, a kind of um, guidance here. We're going to translate this the following way. We introduce a universal quantifier over worlds for all alpha. Okay, um, and then we translate A at alpha. Okay, so that's the translation. And then we have a regular implication with B at uh, P star alpha, okay? So essentially, I just took a look at that rule, and I tried to write it down in the form of a translation from the linear logic formula to the intuitionistic formula, okay? And the idea would somehow be that this thing is provable in intuitionistic logic um, if this thing is provable in linear logic, okay? And in fact, I want some very strong requirements about the connection between the two, which we'll see in a minute. But are we okay sort of so far on this? Does that make sense, what I'm trying to do here? Do you see, if you're trying to prove on the right-hand side, for all alpha, A at alpha implies B at P star alpha, um, for all on the right will introduce a new alpha, okay? Then the implication will introduce a new assumption. And then you're trying to prove from A at alpha, B at P times alpha. So it's actually two steps, right? The universal quantifier and the implication, okay, in order to get the effect of this rule over here. Okay. okay, now we have to bottom out at atoms. So let's come to this because that's also a very important thing. If we have an atomic formula P, and we're introducing it, we're doing it at small p, okay. So what is the rule over here? Let's just remind ourselves. The basic rule is that if you have gamma and you have 
um, some atomic formula at some resource, um, then P is true at that resource. Okay. Um, and by some invariant, which you may or may not decide to keep today, um, this usually should be epsilon or alpha, right? But those two have to be ma have to match up exactly, because these are the resources you have to use, and that matches up exactly with that. Okay. So in order, so in intuitionistic logic, the initial sequence just looked like this: we have some gamma, and we have p. From that, we can prove p, and then we're done. Just looks like that. Okay. So in order to get the effect, what we're going to do is we're going to take our propositions, our atomic propositions from linear logic. We add one more argument, okay, which is the world expression. Okay, so the translation of that is going to be, I'm going to write it as P applied to P. Okay. So then this rule here gets translated into um, in gamma and P, which now depends on P, we have to prove P which now depends on P, so that should succeed. Okay. Um, okay. And this kind of equality here is modulo the, the equations that we want to assume about our, in our domain. So maybe I should have said more specifically we're embedding linear logic into some equational or intuitionistic logic with equations. Okay because we need these world equations in order to manage linear logic. So if you want to make that explicit, which might be a good idea, then we would write this rule like this. P of small p implies P of small q if P equals q, okay, if you can prove that up here. Okay. Um, we also need to think about how we translate um, the additive conjunction. Okay, does somebody have some proposal for that? I have a question. Yep. I'm not sure I understand. Um, <coughs> the, 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 first, the first line of the translation and the second line of the translation must be the same sense, or the, the, the right hand side. Yeah. Uh, because what I thought you just said was in the, when you translate these atoms, we have to. So why, why do we have the why do we take away the at p in the atomic case, but not in the uh, in the function case? Ah, okay. So the at p is not a constructor or a judgment. It's just we translate this formula at the world p. Okay. So this is a two-place function which I'm describing, okay. and I'm making two recursive calls on the same okay. translation functions here and here. Okay. And when I come to the atomic case, I have to preserve the P, and the way I do that is I add another argument to my atomic proposition. Okay. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Okay. Um, okay. So let's try to do the with, and then I want to do an example. So what about, how would we translate A with B? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I want to put parentheses around to make it clear that we're translating these things. Okay, so we're just translating both of them at P, and according to the remarks I made last time, that should kind of work out, hopefully. Okay, um, Okay. so let's go through an example and see if we can... Um, so what I wanted to do was so we have A arrow B, arrow C. Um, okay, let's keep it simple. Arrow B, so it's like this, okay. Um, where A, small A, and small B are atoms. And B, we want to be able to prove that, hopefully, okay. So at the beginning, we translate this at epsilon, right? That's where we start. We translate the whole formula, we have no resources because we want to prove it by itself, okay. So what is that? Okay, so that's an implication. So we get for all alpha 1. And then we have to translate the left-hand side at alpha 1. So I'm going to abbreviate that and just say that's going to be A in alpha 1, right, in two steps. Because it's just small a at alpha. And by this rule here, I get small a 
apply to alpha 1. Then I have intuitionistic implication. So what's the next thing? So here, let's take a pause. So we have to take the whole right-hand side. And translate that at, what is it? Hmm? Alpha 1, right? Alpha 1 star epsilon, which is equal to alpha 1, right? We're okay? We're just unfolding the definition. Okay, so that becomes for all alpha 1, A of alpha 1 implies. So this add alpha 1 with the implication, okay? So we're in this case here. We introduce a new one, which is an alpha 2. We translate A arrow B at alpha 2. And that implies B at alpha 1 star alpha 2. OK? So I've already unfolded the definition here because we came down an atom. I left it in place here. We still need to unfold what that means. OK? And so that now becomes for all alpha 1, A of alpha 1 implies for all alpha 2. OK, so how do we translate this? Mm -hmm. For all alpha 3. OK. And then on the left-hand side, I have A of alpha 3 implies B of alpha 2 times alpha 3. Is that right? Um, OK, and that implies B of alpha 1 star alpha 2. OK, so unless I made a mistake, or you made a mistake, OK, we have the, we have the translation. Are we pretty OK with this? OK. So now we want to be able to prove that, right? So actually, I'm going to shoot for a little bit more. I'm going to try to prove it with focusing, right? Um, because if you take. The, the, the problem in this translation, or in many embeddings, is that when you take one something here, it becomes more than one thing over here. For example, the implication becomes a quantifier and an implication. Okay. So in many translations, what happens is that any form of proof search is blown out of the water because something that's very nice and beautiful focusing here turns into many, many different focusing phases over here. So usually, it's not necessarily a good idea to take one logic and translate into another one to do proof search because you actually might have to work much harder in the image than you have to do in the source of the translation. Okay. So this, however, is designed in such a way that if you have a focusing proof here, it, it translates into something that has a, a similar kind of focusing proof over here. Okay. So in particular, implication and universal quantification are both negative. Okay. So therefore, um, it should be the case, if we did everything right, that these two are always decomposed together. So even though one connective becomes two because they decompose together, they really happen at the same time. There's no additional non-determinism. So let's see if that works out. Okay. So let's take rid get rid of this. Okay. So now our goal is to prove this. Okay. In intuitionistic logic. Um, all right. So what happens here? I haven't formally presented to you the focusing for intuitionistic logic, but we can probably extrapolate from the linear case. So the universal quantifier should be negative. We're on the right. What does that mean? Yeah, we just make new assumptions, and everything is invertible. Okay, so we never have to look back. We just apply the rules because we're in inversion. So alpha 1 is being introduced as an assumption. Then this assumption is introduced. Then alpha 2 is introduced as a parameter. Then this assumption is introduced, and then we have to prove that. Okay. So just by applying inversion a couple of times, okay, we're in a situation where we have A of alpha 1. We have, um, for all alpha 3, A of alpha 3 implies B of alpha 2 times alpha 3. And we try to prove B of alpha 1 star alpha 2. OK? Yeah? So alpha 1 and alpha and 
yeah, so there's a psi here where we say alpha 1 is a world or is a label, and alpha 2 is a label. Okay. So they're all labels, and because we don't have any other things here, I'm just going to omit that. Yeah. So we get to this place, right? Um, the corresponding thing in the original linear logic okay, would be the inversion phase, where you invert this and then you invert that. And what do you end up with that? You have A, A, arrow B, and you have to prove B. Right? That's where we are after the inversion. They still seem to correspond, right? Because that would, this is the translation of A arrow B at alpha 2. This is the translation of A at alpha 1. And this is the translation of B at alpha 1 star alpha 2. So from what we did last time, these still correspond. Okay. So now, how does the proof have to proceed if all the atoms are negative? We have to focus on this thing. If all the atoms are positive, what do we do? We also focus on this, right? In this case, it doesn't matter because if you focus on, if everything is negative, that's okay because this B matches this one. If everything is positive, it's okay because this A already exists in the context here. So anyway, we have to focus on the thing in the middle. And let's just work with negative atoms, okay? Because right now at the translation, okay, we just have negative propositions, okay? So um, we focus on this thing here, okay? And a copy of it stays around, okay, because we're an intuitionistic logic in, in here, okay, so we could focus on again later. But um, so I, again, I'm abbreviating here. Um, so if we're focused on a for all, what do we have to do? We have to find an instance, but of course we postpone finding that until unification tells us what it have to be. Yeah, you're, you're smart enough to look ahead and see it's going to be alpha 1, but we don't know that for, for a little bit, okay? So what happens here is that um, we have to guess some kind of a P, or let's say Q, um, and then we're still focused on the implication. They have the same polarity, we continue. And so then over here, from A at alpha 1, and some other assumptions, we have to prove um, A of alpha, no, actually A of Q. And over here, we have focus on B of, um, actually now I wrote the, okay, uh, alpha 2 star Q, and I have B of alpha 1 star alpha 2. Because we're in backward chaining, I should have written these in the opposite order, okay? because we want to check this first and then solve the sub-goal, right? That's how it works. Um, now we have to check this equation here, okay? Um, this is a negative atom, okay? This can only succeed if this thing is equal to that. In this case, um, by our modified atom rule, we would have to check that alpha star Q equals alpha 1 star alpha 2, right? For this to succeed. And that should tell us that Q equals alpha 1, if we didn't make a mistake, okay? So Q equals alpha 1 um, instantiates this. Here, by the way, we lose focus because it's a negative atom, okay? Um, but we know that Q equals alpha 1, so this is going to be alpha 1. And now the only thing we can do is focus on this thing here, and this will succeed, okay? Yeah? Yeah, because we can also focus on this thing, yeah. but that will fail because B is different from A. Yeah. So in the context, we have two things at that point, um, but the only one that we will be able to focus on in this. Okay. Um, okay, so this seems to work out very nicely, right? So, um, and so here in this proof also, what we do is we focus on this, okay? And then we guess the split that A proves A in focus, and then we focus on the left to prove A, and here we have B in focus, and that proves B, and that succeeds. So the structure of the true proof really is the same, 
okay, after this translation because we preserve um, the polarity of these things. This is negative, this is positive. Uh, this is also interpreted as being negative over here. Okay. Um, so now we, there's a theorem to be proven, okay, that basically says that this kind of translation preserves provability and in fact preserves focusing proofs. Okay. Um, and um, that's proven in the paper here is the consequence of one of the results in there. That's the part that I understand. Okay. And that actually is, it's fairly easy to prove because in this translation there's not much going on. If we didn't do focusing then the theorem would be false. Okay. And the reason is because if you just have to take single steps, you could never get an exact correspondence between the proofs because over here you can extend the alpha, then you can do work somewhere else, then you can come back and use the implication rule and so on. So there's many things you can do over here that you don't have the opportunity to do over here. But if focusing locks you in into doing certain steps together, then focusing proofs in the linear case still correspond to focusing proofs in the implementation. And the nice consequence of that is if you want to implement proof search in linear logic, okay, then it's perfectly adequate with respect to focusing to just implement proof search in intuitionistic logic with equational reasoning in this domain. Okay, you don't lose anything, okay, which is a nice property to have. Okay. And the only thing you have to worry about is how can I solve these equations. Okay. So in fact, like I said, um, I think in the last lecture, one of my students, Sean McLaughlin, who's still working on his thesis in a theorem prover, implemented a theorem prover for linear logic exactly based on this idea. So it's a theorem prover for intuitionistic logic um, where, in addition, you have to solve these kind of equations. Okay? Yep. Yeah. No, it's not easier because you want something provable here, if and only it's provable here, right? But if you just want one direction, not if and only it's But that's not very useful, right? Because if, if you make some kind of over approximation when you do that, then you might say, oh, I have a proof here, and you want to see what it is, and this thing is actually not provable. So it really needs to be an if and only if at the level of provability. And I'm not sure that you can do any much simpler embedding than we have over there. Um, but so there's, so the requirement at level zero is basically saying provable here if and only if provable here. So maybe a simpler embedding can be done. I'm not sure whether, this is pretty simple, okay. But the next requirement is that a proof here corresponds to proof here. Well, that's actually not the case here. But an even stronger requirement would be a focusing proof here corresponds to a focusing proof here, and that's what we actually get, okay. So in this hierarchy of possible theorems in the translation, you can get what we have here is the strongest possible form, okay? Because we show a correspondence of the focusing proofs in the two systems, and that's what you really want to implement. A nice property of this, by the way, if Sean's prover runs and gives an answer, and you want to see what the linear logic proof is, because there's a bijection, you can actually read it off and give back a proof in the linear lambda calculus, okay? Which you can independently check using a, a type checker for linear lambda calculus. Okay, so now comes, the, now comes the new part, the speculative part, the failing part, the wrong part, whatever you want to call it, okay? Because everything is very nice for the negative connectives, okay? So the problem with the positive connectives is the following. Um, <clears throat> so let me uh, make some room here. So if we, let's see, um, so we actually, if you think back on the simple sequence calculus, we actually made a change there in the rule, okay, in the, sim in the sequence calculus before our left rule for implication was this, we have A or B at alpha, and we're we have some other gamma, and we're trying to prove C at alpha star R. Okay, then we consume that from gamma, we take A at P, 
and then we take gamma, okay, and a copy of this. And here we have a gamma, we still have a copy of that. And we get B at beta, and now we try to prove C at, I guess we need to put P in here, remove that, and then have Q, and this should be beta star Q, did I do this right? We had a, that was our rule? Yes, verified, okay. So the rule, the left rule that corresponds to that actually looks different. Because when you have for all alpha and this in the context, the, what the rule looks like is something like this. If we have gamma and A implies B at alpha, okay, and we have gamma A implies B at alpha, and we can prove uh, A at P then we keep that. And in order to get B, we have to say, um, okay, we need the alpha and we also need the P. Okay. And so then if we think about that, if the things that in the context are not just alpha or epsilon, then this alpha really could be an arbitrary Q which is propagated through, okay? And so this will be B at P times Q. And now the interesting thing is the right-hand side actually plays no role in this role, okay? So if you try to read off what the left rule would be for this thing, okay, this is what you get, okay? Because the implication of the translation will be something like this. So you can instantiate the alpha with something, um, which would be uh, the P, and then you add that to, um, so in the P and the Q's got mixed up, but you just add that what you already have and you get P star Q over here, because this alpha can be instantiated with a Q, okay? So you see that's a quite a different rule, right? Um, so this process from here, to here, this is what we call a tethered sequence calculus. Um, because any of the left rules that we apply, okay, can only be applied if you have an immediate tie to the right-hand side. And so this is only allowed if alpha exists on the left-hand side and you have license to use that over here, okay. And this rule here is untethered. Because we can apply the left rule and we, can, we don't even have to look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side just is unchanged in this rule, okay? Um, so in general, this seems like a bad idea, okay? Because you could apply the left rule to something that is not really usable, okay? Because what could happen is that this is an alpha here which doesn't occur on the right-hand side. So applying the left rule here doesn't really make any progress, right? Because it doesn't get you to something that you can actually use. Does that make sense, what I'm talking about here? Okay. So in general, this seems like a bad idea to untether the rules. But what saves us here is that we're only doing this um, when we want to focus this calculus. And when we're focusing this calculus, we only apply the ref left rule to such uh, an assumption here if we got this as a consequence from focusing on something. And so we only have to make sure that at the rule where we focus, that we focus on something that is actually we're allowed to focus on. And then all the cues that we actually arrive at here, they will all contain this assumption alpha, okay? So it's kind of a, the focusing avoids that we're doing a lot of unnecessary work in this kind of situation, okay? In this untethered, untethered form, okay? Um, okay. So the essence of the proof, by the way, that this works is a generalization of what we had before, where we have to talk about um, if you take the, if you have a resources R over here, you have to be able to restrict the left-hand side to just these resources R in some way that the result is provable. Because decisions will be made in different points in time. Um, and uh, surprisingly, this works out, okay? So you can untether the implication left rule is what this is saying, okay? 
Um, okay. So, and I hope the example made that plausible, even if I'm not going to go through the proof. Okay. The problem with the with the um, uh, positive formulas is that they cannot be untethered in the same way. Okay. So, let's look at the uh, tensor left. Okay. Or at least possibly they cannot be. Let's we'll have to figure this out. Okay. So we have gamma A tensor B at this is our original version. And we're trying to prove C at alpha times R. Okay, anybody remember how this works? What's the left row for tensor? Yeah, so we introduce two new ones, beta 1 and beta 2. We have A at beta 1, B at beta 2. And we keep around the A tensor B because everything is monotonic at alpha. And on the right-hand side, we take the alpha and replace it by beta 1 times beta 2. And we carry through the remaining R. Okay. Um, so the question is, if we can some, find some kind of a way um, to detether this rule, so we can apply the ref rule independently of what happens on the right. Okay. So there is one way that's done in the paper. And I have a different proposal which we can shoot some holes in. Okay. So the way I want to do it. Um, uh, okay, so the question is how do we translate A tensor B at P? Okay, so the way I would say it is um, it's more motivated by the left rule, by the right rule actually. So let's look at the right rule just to, um, as a counterbalance to this. Um, so if we have gamma and we try to prove A tensor B, what does the right rule look like? Anybody remember from last time? Or reconstruct it? So we prove A at P, B at Q. And here we get it at P star Q, right? So that's somehow the idea of the right rule that we have to be able to split our assumptions um, exactly between these two or something. By the strengthening theorem, anything that's not mentioned in here. So this really corresponds to delta and this delta prime, and this is a combination of delta and delta prime. That was the idea. Okay. So now we're translating at P, and P is supposed to be this here. So what I'm going to say is, um, there exists some alpha and there exists a beta such that P equals alpha star beta. And um, I have the translation of A at alpha um, and the translation of B at beta. Okay. So if I'm translating to something that I don't know, okay, um, so this P here actually, maybe I should call it R. Then I'm saying R can be split into two pieces. One I called alpha, which corresponds to the P. One I call beta corresponds to the Q. And I can prove A at P and B, P, B at Q. OK. Um, OK, so we have to worry about the equality. OK. So we need to introduce into the intuition cyclic one more thing here, which is P equals Q. OK. And we need to worry about what the rules are for that. Okay. Um, okay. So what are the rules for P equals Q? Where's my eraser? Okay. 
So in intuitionistic logic, if I'm trying to prove p equals q, what would have to be the case? Right. p has to be equal to q according to the rules. Um, that's going to be insufficient, as we'll see in a second. Okay. Um, because the question is, what's the left rule for equality? So we have an assumption of this p equal q. How do you use that? So, right. So, if these are ordinary first order terms, okay, then we should be able to like break them down by the kind of equations that we had, like breaking down to the pieces, right? Um, but they aren't ordinary equations. They are equations which have some equalities associated with them. So, for example, if we see that there is, if this is p1 times p2 and this is q1 times q2, there's actually four different possibility for breaking them down, at least, okay? So, what we do instead is, um, when we have equations, we add them to a constraint store. So we have a constraint store. I'm running out of Greek letters. Any proposals? Greek letter I didn't use yet? Okay. Oops. Upsilon, whatever that, I hope this is a reasonable rendering. Did I ever tell you that, uh, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> Actually, my first year as a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon, right? Um, I was just an exchange student, and I was volunteering to give a, a talk in the seminar on on uh, decision procedures. And because I happened to be from Germany, my advisor gave me this paper from 1910, written by this guy in Germany, to show that monadic second-order logic is decidable. And it was all written in German, which is some ancient notation. So I spent like two weeks, three weeks reading through this paper. I didn't know very much logic, trying to figure this out. And um, it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. Then I was trying, then I wrote down the first line, okay. And I said something like rho equals sigma. And then, you know, one of the professors of the audience gets up, that's not a rho. Okay, you make a rho like this or whatever, right? <laughs> okay, so. So if my epsilon is not really epsilon, epsilon or whatever, you have to bear with me. I have a history of writing Greek letters in a bad way. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So anyway, so what we do is we just add it to here. Um, and actually, it could stay here because we're in the intuitionistic case. Okay. So that doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, and over here now, what we have to say is whether the equation that we assumed in epsilon entail that equation that we're trying to prove on the right-hand side. Okay, so we have to go from just solving equations to being able to decide entailment between equations when we actually add equality to our logic. Okay. Um, now, it turns out that this is okay, um, I think. Okay. Um, and uh, oh, we should also see which one is uh, which one is positive and which one is negative, or whether equality is positive or negative. Um, which of these two rules would be invertible? This one here, right? Whenever you see the equality, move it into here. Okay. So equality is negative. So I actually wrote it in this line here, uh, positive. I wrote it in this line with the positive things. Okay. Um, okay. And here I might have to wait. And the reason I might have to wait is because, for example, if I want to say that alpha equals beta uh, entails beta equals alpha, okay, at this point my, my context here of equations is empty. I cannot prove that. Okay. Once I move that into here, then according to my theory, if alpha equals beta, then entails that beta equals alpha. So on the right-hand side, I might have to wait until the left rule has been applied. Okay. All right, good. So, okay, so let's check whether the polarity of these things work out. Because A tensor B is positive, okay? 
So if I'm focused on the right, I should be able to do that. If I have it on the left, I should be able to invert. The existential quantifier is positive. That means that I can invert it on the left. Can invert it on the left. Now conjunction. In intuitionistic logic, we choose. we choose, right? Because it can be either one. So we already have one here. Let's call this minus. That's this one here. And we have another one up here, which is a positive conjunction, luckily. And so that's what we want to use here and here. So if we do focusing, all these things, because they're all positive, they should all happen together, right? So that seems to be a, a positive step here, so to speak. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, right, so what should happen with the one? Okay, it's a nullary case of multiplicative conjunction, so we just need to take the nullary case of that. What would that com come out to be? R equals epsilon. Yeah. Okay, seems plausible, right? Because the, the right rule just says one, we can prove one at epsilon. That means R has to be equal to epsilon. Okay. And if it's the left-hand side, we should be able to assume that R is equal to epsilon. Um, okay, so hopefully this kind of thing might work, okay? So since I don't have a proof of that this kind of thing works, um, oh, by the way, yeah, so this is positive, this is positive, okay? So we're okay in that way. Um, since I just thought of it this morning, I don't have a proof, of course, but we can try examples, right? If it fails, we might find, be able to find some counterexample. Um, Okay, so let's something simple. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so, um, Okay, so let's try to prove currying, okay? So something like A tensor B, uh, actually these are atoms. Arrow C implies that A implies B implies C. Is that the direction I want? Um, seems we can try that, okay? <coughs> All right, so first we have to translate this, right, at epsilon. Okay, so um, it's like this, right? And so what do we get here? We get something like for all alpha 1, a translation of A tensor B arrow C at alpha 1 implies the translation of the right-hand side at, also at alpha 1, right? Because it's alpha 1 times epsilon. Are we, did I do this right? Okay. So we have for all alpha 1, how do we translate this? Okay, it's another for all. So we get it for all alpha 2, A tends to B, translated at alpha 2 implies C um, alpha 1 star alpha 2. And then this thing um, at alpha 1 should become A, okay, for all, what are we up to? Alpha 3, A at alpha 3 implies for all alpha 4 B at alpha 4 implies C alpha 1 star alpha 3 star alpha 4, okay? Unless I made a mistake there. Um, this is left nested twice, so I get one quantifier and get A at alpha 3, another quantifier and get B at alpha 4. Then I get 
C and I have to multiply with the alpha 1, the alpha 3, and the alpha 4. I get this. Okay. Okay, and now we need to unwind the left-hand side here, this part. This part here. And what is that? So we have for all alpha 1, um, for all alpha 2. And now we need to get the existential quantifier there. Exists alpha 5, exists alpha 6. Alpha 2 equals alpha 5 times alpha 6. And A of alpha 5 and A of alpha 6. Um, OK, imply C of alpha 1 star alpha 2 implies this whole stuff. OK. Um, I need room. Maybe we're comfortable with this part now. So I can make myself room here. OK, so we have that thing over there. Um, so if we're trying to prove that, let's unwind that for a little bit. So the first thing we introduce is the, uh, is the alpha 1, right? And then this assumption here. So we have an assumption in the context for all alpha 2. Um, exists alpha 5, exists alpha 6. And then alpha 2 equals alpha 5 star alpha 6. And A of alpha 5 and B of alpha 6. OK, that's the first assumption. Next assumption would be, uh, or sorry, implies C of alpha 1 times alpha 2, right? Is that what it says over there? Yeah, I think so. OK. OK, that's our first assumption. What other assumptions do we have? We should get um, A of alpha 3. We should get B of alpha 4. And uh, we're trying to prove on the right-hand side C of alpha 1 times alpha 3 times alpha 4, right? OK, so I have three assumptions, and I'm trying to prove that. So let's look at the way the proof would proceed now. If we did this in linear logic, right, because we want this to be modeling that, what would we focus on here? So we would have three assumptions, this one, this one, and this one. So we just focus on this complicated thing, right? Because they're focusing on these is not going to get you anywhere. OK, so focusing on this, what happens here? Um, so we have to guess this, uh, this alpha 2, OK, but it's going to be some q. Um, and then we have an implication. And we have to solve this as a conclusion of the implication. Um, and then we have to match, in the one sub goal here, we have to match C of uh, alpha 1 star alpha 3 star alpha 4. And on the right hand side, we have C of uh, alpha 1 star q, right? And that would be in focus. So these two things have to be equal for this part to succeed. And then the sub-goal would be this existentially quantified thing, right? That would be over here. And we would try to prove that. OK, if we're focused on an existential, OK, how do we proceed? Focus on the right on an existential. We're trying to prove that. How does it work? Hmm? Right, we have to introduce a new unknown, right? Because we're trying to prove there exists some alpha 5. We're focused on the right. We don't know what it is. We have to introduce a unification variable. So this is going to be some, um, 
Q5, this is going to be some Q6. And so what we get here is something like, um, so the first thing says that um, Q equals Q5 star Q6, right? That's this part here. Um, and this part here would say um, A of Q5 and A of Q6, right? B of Q6. Uh, B of Q6, right. And this would still be in focus, right? Okay, because we're still in focus on the right. Okay. Um, this was a positive conjunction if I did this correctly. Okay, so we still should be breaking this down. Um, so what we should in this check at this point, if our assumption that we have about equalities is going to imply Q equals Q5 times Q6, we have no assumptions, so that just comes down to solving that kind of equation. But before we do that, we would go over and solve the equations over here, right? Um, because we're always looking at the head first. What do we learn from this here? So Q equals alpha 3 times alpha 4. And so the equation we have to solve here is alpha 3 times alpha 4 equals Q5 star Q6. OK. Um, OK, so looking ahead, um, how would we choose these? Um, we want A of Q5 to succeed when in the next focusing phase. So Q5 would have to be alpha 3, right? And we want Q, B of Q6 to succeed, so Q6 is equal to alpha 4. And so we can choose Q5 and Q6 to be equal to alpha 3 and alpha 4. OK. Um, so when we say Q5 equals alpha 3 and Q6 equals alpha 4, all the constraints that we have here can be solved. And the proof proceeds in the, in the same kind of uh, phases. We still have, just like when everything is negative, uh, we have to have one additional focus on A and one additional focus on B to prove A tensor B. Okay. Okay, so at least in this example, it seems to work out, okay, um, that we can define it like this. Um, okay. Um, okay, maybe we should continue and try to do the other connective since at least so far I haven't found a counterexample unless one of you guys sees one. So, so far it seems to be working out, right? In the other direction? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay, it's possible. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the thing that gives me some hope is that the polarity of these things matches up exactly with the polarity of the connectors that we're starting with. So maybe it's possible. Um, okay, so let's see, what else do we have? I guess we have bang, right? Usually that should be fun. So how do we translate bang A at R? Any ideas? So let's be motivated by the right rule, right? So to prove bang A, um, this context has to be empty, this context. You have to prove A. So once we translate that, um, it's going to look like a gamma, uh, which has some epsilon in it, but bang A has to be at epsilon. And then we have to prove from the same gamma A at epsilon, right? That would be the rule. In fact, I think we had that rule on the board, right? So the point is that in this proof, you cannot use any unrestricted resources. And then this proof also, well, any uh, um, alpha labeled resources, only the ones that are labeled with epsilon. Okay, 
So that would correspond here to saying that r must be equal to epsilon and uh, a is translated at epsilon, right? Okay. Um, okay, let's try a simple example of that. Um, Okay, so um, what would be a good thing to try? Um, bang A implies A, just to start. So um, bang A, lolly A, um, okay, at epsilon. And so what does that become? It's bang A, uh, okay, for all alpha, um, bang A at alpha implies A at alpha. And that should be an atomic formula just to make things simple. So if that's atomic, then this becomes uh, for all alpha. And this becomes alpha equals epsilon and A of epsilon. And that's supposed to apply A of alpha. OK, are we doing, am I doing the right thing here? So how do we, if you're trying to prove that, right, what happens? OK, so the for all alpha in the implication gets unwound. Um, so we would get um, alpha equals epsilon. And A of epsilon entails A of alpha, right? OK, so what happens is that conjunction is broken down, and we make into epsilon the assumption alpha equals epsilon. And now we have A of epsilon proves A of alpha. And the way we check that is to see if that constraint, alpha equals epsilon, entails that epsilon equals alpha. And that should be the case. If alpha equals epsilon, then epsilon equals alpha. OK. So yes, we can prove that. Um, we should also fail to prove the opposite. Right? That's always a good test. Uh, OK. So it should not be the case that we can prove A proves bang A, right? So let's see if we can prove that, and then uh, we can go home and finish the lecture, OK? So if we translate at, at epsilon, what does it become? It becomes for all alpha, I actually should write lowercase again, A of alpha implies alpha equals epsilon and A of epsilon, right? Because I translated this implication into universal quantification. And then the right-hand side, the bang, I translated alpha this way. And so the parentheses are this way. So if I try to prove that, I break down the alpha. And I get A of alpha in my context. And I try to prove alpha equals epsilon and A of epsilon. And I can't prove that because I can't prove that alpha equals epsilon, because I have no assumptions in this case. So indeed, the proof would break at this point. Okay. Um, okay. So we might actually be OK. Do you have any suggestions, something to try to break it? Curry example in the other direction. OK. Hopefully, we can do that. But that's something that should be provable, right? Yeah. 
So you want to try something that we can't prove, right? Yeah. We might be able to do something that's structurally wrong, even though it's not. I don't know. Like, which, might, which might make progress towards something that's actually <laughs> OK. Um, should we try some very simple things like A with B and A tensor B? They should be somehow, they shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to go back and forth between them just to see what happens. So if you have A tensor B implies A with B, okay, and we do that at epsilon, um, what do we get? We get for all alpha, A tensor B at alpha implies a epsilon and B epsilon. And this, if it matters, should be a negative conjunction. OK. And then this thing here in the middle should be translated as for all alpha. Um, exists alpha 1, exists alpha 2. A of alpha 1, uh, alpha equals alpha 1 star alpha 2, um, A of alpha 1 and A of alpha 2. Uh, okay, implies A of epsilon and B of epsilon. Okay. Oh, here, in these two, because we quantify with the alpha. Yeah. And also, this should be B of alpha 2, right? OK. Um, all right, so now if we try to prove that, we introduce a new alpha, and we introduce into the context all of that. And on the right-hand side, we have that. Because that's negative, that should break down immediately. And this should be all invertible. Um, we should break all that down. So should we, we have alpha equals alpha 1 star alpha 2 in our epsilon context. And we have A of alpha 1. We have A of alpha 2 um, in our, our gamma context. And we have to prove A of alpha, right? That would be in the one branch. In the other branch, we would have to prove B of alpha. OK, so now in order for this to succeed, uh, why do I write A of? In order for this first one to succeed, these two would have to match up. So alpha would have to be equal to alpha 1. But our constraint says alpha equals alpha 1 star alpha 2. So that fails the way it should, because A tensor B does not imply A with B. OK. so. Uh, okay. Okay, so let me try to summarize then the conjecture, okay? So what we have here, we have um, a translation, which is compositional on the formulas, which takes the formula A and interprets it at some multi expression B, and that gives us some other formula in the intuitionistic logic. So this is in linear logic here, and we get some A prime, and this is in intuitionistic logic with equalities. And the claim, which so far doesn't seem to have a counterexample, is that, um, okay, so three stages. First stage would be if there's a proof here, if and only if there's a proof here. Uh, the second stage would be, um, well, that would be false. Every proof here has a unique proof over here. But the third stage, if there's every focusing proof over here corresponds to focusing proof over there, we still haven't found a counterexample too. So what I'm guessing is that there is a correspondence here between focusing proofs here with the focusing proofs over there. Um, and uh, so how would we prove that? So um, what we would have to do is 
we'd have to establish some way um, first of all if there's a focusing proof over here to translate it one into one on the image of the translation that seems not so difficult okay because we have a lot of structure over here that we can exploit when we do that thing over here um, the hard part I think will be to show that if you have some kind of sequence over here and it doesn't look as simple as this, right? Because there's going to be P's and Q's in these things. Um, if you have a sequent over here in, in the intuitionistic logic, which is stable, okay, then we can translate it back to a sequent over here in the linear case. And that requires some kind of a analysis of the resources, and it has to take these equations into account. So I suspect that the, that the, that the step from here to here will be a non-trivial proof. And it might be somewhat similar to the kind of thing that we do in the paper, except that um, what's happening is that uh, some of the complexity in the paper um, is in the translation of the positives, and that's actually sort of shunted off to the side uh, in reasoning about entailment with equalities. Okay. Um, but at least at the moment, it doesn't seem implausible that we should be able to do this. Okay. Um, Okay, so if we could, um, then this would, basic, this would be another way um, from the one that's, that's in the paper where we can take linear logic and give a compositional semantics of it in intuitionistic logic. And the only thing we have to, uh, we have to do equational reasoning, and in fact we have to do equational um, reasoning with equational entailment. Now also something that's discussed in the paper, which I'm not going to do in lecture, but that might actually be an interesting exercise to do um, is we can do this from ordered logic okay into an intuitionistic logic and the domain will just be different okay so what will happen is that we have the, the these connectives here that do this kind of thing and then we have some kind of a, a unary constructor um, I think in the paper we call it iota which takes something which is in the um, uh, in the linear domain and embeds it into the ordered domain. And in the ordered domain, we have things like, you know, p star q uh, dot q r equals p dot uh, q dot r. So we have associativity. And we also have some form of unit, p, I'm not sure, what, what do we call it? maybe epsilon also equals epsilon dot p. But we don't have uh, equals p. Um, but we don't have, of course, the commutativity because it's an ordered context. Um, and then we have some laws that, that talk about, um, about the, uh, the iota that connects these two kind of equation of theory with, with each other. Um, if you try to do affine logic in this way, it gets a little bit funky because what happens is that if you go to the initial sequence, so right now we can do the following. We can say... Um, if you have some kind of, um, let's say, A at P proves A at Q, and then you have to just check that P equals Q. And in this logic, you would have to check that as an entailment, okay, from epsilon, okay, like this. Um, in affine logic, okay, you don't have to use all the assumptions. There can be some slack left over over here that you don't actually have in P. So you might have something like, uh, okay, let's just do an example. So you might say A affine B affine C, uh, A, um, and that's certainly provable in affine logic, okay. If you translate this into this logic, what you would get is that you get for all alpha, alpha 1, A at, or let's just write alpha, A at alpha implies for all beta, B at beta implies A at alpha star beta. So that would be the linear translation, okay? Now, if you unwind this, then you are left with trying to prove that. Beta proves A at alpha star beta. Okay? And in linear logic, you will fail 
because this alpha is not equal to alpha star beta, right? So that's why you can't prove this in linear logic. Now you can prove it in affine logic. And the way we can accommodate that is we can say that at the atom case, if you have A of P um, proves A of Q, if P times Q equals, uh, P times R equals Q for some R, okay? Um, or you could define it, well, so that's already definable in the language because we have an existential. Um, it's a little bit odd. Or you can say P is less or equal to Q, which means that everything in P also is in Q, okay? But there could be some extra stuff in Q which you're allowed to ignore. Um, so probably the simplest way, well, I'm not sure which one is better. Either we can do it like this by introducing these additional variables, um, where this is a star operator. Um, or you can introduce into the intuitionistic logic um, the relation P is less or equal to Q, and then have some constrained reasoning about P is less or equal to Q and not just about the equality. Okay. Um, but the ordered case is definitely the trickiest one. And Chris can tell you more about that uh, if she still remembers. <laughs> um, because actually in her undergraduate thesis, um, she gave a resource semantics for ordered linear logic. Um, and I don't remember now exactly how it relates to what I'm doing over here. Do you? Right, but did you just do the negative fragment? Yeah, I just did, I just did all that. Okay, so we didn't have to worry about the existential that I come up here, yeah. Okay. So I think on the negative fragment it's very similar, um, and you just have to characterize the equation of theory appropriately, which we didn't really worry about here. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a few things on my stack to talk about. I'm, I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do next. Um, and, and I'm going to try to bring out a couple of additional questions. I already have many questions to work on, but I'm going to try to bring out a couple of additional questions that have to do with the material from the last couple of lectures uh, for the last homework. So some of the things on my stack I want to talk about classical linear logic, okay, um, and the relationship to the intuitionistic case. Um, and I want to talk about using linearity and affine logics for characterizing computational complexity. Okay, so that's some work um, that's been going on for probably at least 15 years or so. Um, roughly the idea is that by using the ideas underlying linear logic, you can control use of resources, and thereby you can control either time or space complexity of the programs that you write in it just by typing them in the linear lambda calculus. Um, so, but if there's something else that you know about that you'd like to hear about, it, you can, you're welcome to send me an email. I think there's four more lectures, so I can certainly um, be guided by what you want to talk about. Um, okay. If there's questions on this, I can't answer them, but I can try. Okay. <laughs> 